This is the Balanced Growth Show with Dr. Travis Perry, helping successful business professionals like you achieve balance in their lives. Welcome to another episode of the Balanced Advisor Podcast. I'm Dr. Perry. Today, I have a very special guest, Jeffrey Johnston. He has uh, been changing lives, going around and really putting forth his idea of better mental health. And we're going to get deep into this concept today. Um, This is a different kind of episode. We've never really gone this deep um, with someone. So I kind of want to give a quick just warning, maybe even a trigger warning that what we discussed today about uh, suicide and alcoholism and mental health concepts uh, may be an issue. And if, if so, we understand, but we hope that actually you'll come along with us on this journey. Um, Jeff is the founder of Premier Investments of Iowa, Inc., and he's the co-host of the Premier Investments Financial Hour for 13 years on 600 AM WMT Radio. After the death of his oldest son, Seth, to fentanyl at the age of 23, and his wife of 21 years, Prudence, age 46, to alcohol, he's become an advocate for change in the mental health space. He's an OSJ, branch manager with over 33 years of experience, and he founded the Living Undeterred Project to show individuals how to live intentionally in the face of adversity. Better, not bitter. He's currently touring, or he just finished up touring the U.S., Mm -hmm. bringing attention to this issue with the Living Undeterred U.S. Tour. He's got a book out. This one's for you. Um, And, you know, you'll see him post in on social media or have posts on social media with with the bus, as I call Mm -hmm. it. Um, So, Jeff, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for being willing to share your experience, man. Yeah, Travis, this is great. I've been following your story. Uh, Some of your guests have been on my show. Um, There's really interesting dynamic here with um, my previous life, as I like to say, as a financial, although I'm still, you know, a financial advisor from all sense and purposes, I'm just not practicing. Uh, And then how I pivoted to what I call the mental health wild, wild west. And um, what I've learned a lot on this journey, I'm 56. So I still think I have a lot of years ahead of me to give back. And, but my priority priorities have really shifted and I've evolved into a, a completely different human being than I was five years ago. So we can, we can talk about that. And I, I'm really excited to be on your show. I, I've, like I said, I, I still, my heart's with the advisory space. I still miss the interactions with the clients and the, the, the stakeholders and the, the conferences. I miss that. I do, but I just feel like I'm more valuable now on this other side of the fence on the mental health side. Yeah. Well, I think increasingly, I mean, I remember being a young financial advisor, feeling like I was in the mental health space mm-hmm. half the yeah, time, exactly. where <laughs> which really has driven me to, you know, do the master's in psychology and understand human behavior and get a PhD. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. I think that at this stage of the game, um, at least in this industry, that there's a lot more leaning towards behavioral you know, finance, which is a piece, you know, behavioral psychology is only a piece of psychology, Mm -hmm. but at least it's heading in a, in a direction that is more less wink and a nod at mental health, but more of embracing how this affects our clients. So we're going to have a great conversation here, but first you have to catch us up to speed, bridge this gap. Most of the my guests, I'm asking them how they got into this space. Um, really, I'm going to ask you, how did you get out of this space and into the mental health field? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I will start with this. Uh, at age, age 50, October 4th, 2016, was like any other day for me, Travis. You know, I was um, pat myself on the back. I, I, I had reached kind of that pinnacle that I had started out with when I was 23, when I started my investment firm. You know, at, at, my, at our peak on that day, we had about 700 million of AUM. So we were a good size uh, branch. Um, I had nine advisors in the firm and seven full time staff, you know, married 21 years. My wife, Prudence, you know, nine years younger than me, just beautiful, vibrant, you know, could radiate a room. Three boys, Seth's 23, Ian's 15, Roman's 13. No debt, very little debt. Just, I mean, I really felt. I had made it, you know, pat myself on the back. I think the perception from the public was that I'd made it, but the reality was there was cracks um, as, as there is in every family. I was a functional alcoholic since eighth or ninth grade. So that means I drank five days a week for 
well, 30 something years. Um, I was a compulsive gambler for probably 15 to 20 years of that time, uh, mainly in my 30s and 40s. I didn't do as much as that uh, as of late, but our marriage was solid. The kids were doing good. Um, but there were, there were cracks, you know, that now I find out as a mental health advocate that everybody has cracks. If I dig deep enough, some are self-induced, some are just by circumstance and, and some was just by bad luck. But anyway, on that fateful day, you know, I got that call at six 30 in the morning that as a parent, you just, you know, you know, sometimes when you click on that email, Travis, or you hear the knock on the door, or you get that call that pit in your stomach where you just have that feeling that something horrific's on the other line. And so I knew the call was getting at 6.30 in the morning, something bad. So I was just dropped Ian off to play golf. He was a sophomore uh, playing for districts and um, waving to the coach. And again, this is all in my book, if anyone's interested in getting a little bit more deep dive. But I answered the phone and you know, immediately became a member of a club that I didn't ask to join and one I can never leave. And that's the parent of a deceased child. And um, our oldest son, Seth, uh, was found dead in a hotel room in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, Heroin laced with fentanyl on his bed. His belt was wrapped as a tourniquet. And I still carry that belt with me today. And some may think that's morbid, but for me, it's a, it's a, it's a dual purpose because a belt can keep your pants up for you, but it also can use to kill you. In this case, it did both for my son. So for me, that duality was a very interesting kind of a psychological or philosophical type angle as I navigated further down this road of mental health advocacy. But anyway, so uh, you can imagine how that went down. I had to go home and tell my wife that uh, Seth was dead and Seth uh, at age 23 died from heroin, but that's not who he was. Um, my book has a lot of stories about when he was younger and you know, the, the fact that Seth was like any other, any other kid. And, but he was given Adderall at 16 and that started his journey of um, addiction and abuse and um, undiagnosed or misdiagnosed mental health issues. And uh, that six year journey was a train that I knew was going to go off the cliff, but I couldn't figure out a way to stop it. And so I went home that day. I knew my boys, my little, my, my youngest boys were going to get home. And um, I knew I had to say something impactful. So I said, um, First of all, I said, boys, you know, I got some really bad news. Your, your brother's dead. And my wife's sitting off to my right and the two boys are sitting on the couch and my middle son looks up at me immediately, like within a couple seconds, Travis. And he goes, how do you die, dad? Drugs? Because he knew at 15 that that's how his brother was going to die. We all did. And um, I knew I had to say something impactful. So this became really what I am all about today. And that's the bitter versus better mindset. You know, are you a better man or a bitter man? Um, the, the two roads metaphor. And so I said this to the boys, it's a chapter in my book called the two roads. I was very candid and authentic with them. And I said, boys, we have one of two roads to go down. We have a road of inspiration, motivation, and this can be a life-changing event, or we have a road of anger, despair, and hatred, and we could become alcoholics or addicts ourselves. I'm on the first road. I ask you to join me. And the reason I said it that way is I didn't want to tell them how to grieve, I was going to show them how to grieve, right? Super dad, right? Well, it didn't happen that way. Um, first 14 months after Seth's death, my wife and I drank seven days a week. I stayed home. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I sat in bed, wandered around my house. Didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die. It's the perfect purgatory. And then on December 24th, 2017, I looked in the mirror and I said, I'm done. I quit. I'm not going to drink anymore. I haven't had a drop since. It's been the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. I don't call myself sober because that implies I'm in a fight. Um, I just choose not to drink. I mean, I'm not that smart. I never made honor roll once in my entire life. And I'm not going to try to act like I'm smarter than this. I just, for me, it's as simple as not, not wanting to drink right this moment. So I just don't drink. And uh, I thought that would help my wife, but that didn't. And in June uh, 29th of 2021, I buried my lovely wife, Prudence, of 21 years, age 46, um, dead alcoholism. So <laughs> that's a lot in five years, right? My mom died during this time too. Um, so yeah, death can either be an opportunity for you to become better or it can be an excuse to become bitter. And I, after some work and some trial and error, here I am. And my life's mission, my calling, I guess, for lack of a better way or my meaning and purpose 
my ex- existentialism is to simultaneously get people to understand they can make better choices in difficult situations. But I'm not, I'll be honest with you, Travis, a lot of this is about me. A lot of this is about making sure I don't, I can't leave my other two boys losing a dad. So my self therapy, my self care, my, my work every day is to go on podcasts, to continue writing, to continue the journey. And that's what this is all about. So yeah, I mean, five years ago, we would have been talking about all this financial advisory stuff. And so, but there's a lot I learned, you know, there's a whole bunch I learned as an advisor that's really helped me uh, become who I am today. I appreciate you being better and sharing because this is a journey I've been following of yours and really reached out to see, you know, we have so much in common in the fact that we're both pursuing passions as we started off in this field. Um, but you telling your story and being able to let us in a little bit on what's happened. I know you've told the story before, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily make it easier. I think it just makes it better, right? It makes it Mm -hmm. bearable as you mentioned. And I love, I love your mindset and what you're doing now to help others to live undeterred, whether that's prevention or coping um, or all of it, right? This Mm -hmm. is, this is incredibly important. So we're going to take this in a little bit of a different direction because I, I'm relating with you when my father passed away and I'm feel, having those feelings again and I'm thinking about this and it really was a point in my life where I decided I'm going to take my career and my life in so many different directions. I was dealing with a lot of cracks at mm-hmm. age 26 that I thought I'd never be dealing with. Uh, a lot of that was stress-induced and so we started working on changing the business, changing my education, health, our finances. And we had a whole overhaul, which I mentioned in my book, Achieving Balance. So there's a lot, you know, a similar here. It seems like your five years, very similar to my five years, although not the same. My child um, did not, you know, have the same fate as yours. My wife is still living, Mm -hmm. but it's this um, event that I think a lot of people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Um, whether they didn't have the exact same circumstances. I think every one of us has in our life times where we can decide we can be better from this. Mm -hmm. We can be better from this. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I'm just in a roundabout long answered ways trying to say, thank you. Thank you for being a great example of this and for being better. You bring up a good point, Travis, if I can jump in, please. And that's this temptation to compare grief and I know, I know a lot of people can't relate to what I what I've gone through. Now, in the space I'm in, I'm talking to moms and dads every day that have lost kids every day. So honestly, I talk to people every day that can relate to me. But the average podcast I'm on, the average group I speak with, they haven't been through what I've been through. Some have been through worse. They've been sexually molested. Uh, I, I've never had that happen to me. So I, I'm very cautious on how I present my story because I'm not trying to do it to get pity and sympathy. If anything, I'm trying to get, you know empathy and compassion. So that can fuel my fire and keep me going. But, you know, if you don't have kids and you're not married and you put down your cat today, that's pretty darn devastating. And, and, and for you to sit there and hear my story and go, well, I shouldn't feel bad because it's a cat and this guy just, you know, that's something I think is a dangerous slope. And I think, I think as advocates for mental health, I need to have that vulnerable doorway open that, you know, no matter what you are sharing with me, don't try to compete with my grief. And don't compete with how I handle with it either, because I'm Jeff Johnston. I'm wired differently, you know, and just because it seems like this stuff rolls off my back. You, you don't know two days ago on Seth's death date, how bad it was, you know, and everyone follows me and everyone thinks I'm Mr. Living Undeterred, but I'm human, you know, and I cry probably more than most people. I know I cry more than most men. I mean, I cry five times a day, minimum hard a day. And before Seth died, I cried maybe five times a year, you know? So part of what I'm trying to do is get men to start looking at being vulnerable and and to be able to talk about what's happened to them in their childhood or something traumatic or unfulfilled goals they haven't met, you know, why are they drinking every night after work, you know? 
Uh, that's, that's a lot of where kind of excites me actually the, the psychology and the physiology and people like Daniel Crosby, who I've had on my podcast and, and he was in my book because he's such a great individual that can really study behavioral economics, you know, people's relationships with money and then see how that can really manifest into mental health issues that really don't have anything to do with money, but they do, they start with money, you know? Yeah. I appreciate this. Uh, Brene Brown talks Mm -hmm. about empathy versus sympathy Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I, I know we could go down that road, but she's, she's a great one. I'd give her a recommendation resource from Dan Crosby's great as well, but yeah, you're right. It's not so much comparing grief as it is just recognizing that we all have something in our life that could be it, like could, could make change. As I've studied change, I've found usually we don't make change until there's a big enough pain in our life. Disturbed. Yeah. Yeah. That disturbs yep. the normal yep. patterns of behavior that we say, right. okay, it's going from, oh, maybe I should do that pre-contemplation to, oh, maybe yep. I should, you know, actually take some action on this and t- get in the action zone. So anyway, we, addiction cycles and, uh, empathy and sympathy. We talk a lot about this in the psychological realm. Um, the reason why I've gotten into this space really was, as I told you in the pre-show, it was about stress right? and how people cope or don't cope. right? And, and I think there's a lot of addictions that come because they don't understand, individuals don't understand how to cope with or prevent even some of the stresses that they're carrying. And so you're right. They go home and they drink at night. That's mm-hmm. their out. That's their self-medication um, that, that causes these other problems. I, I like to focus on the definition of balance. Mm-hmm. So a guy who's you know really in, in, in any other respect uh, of this field, at least this financial industry, you're at the top of your game, right? You're the OSJ of mm-hmm. 700 million of assets mm-hmm. for management. The career, the, the the success there, marriage was phenomenal, and then dominoes mm-hmm. happened. You know, we could look at what definition of balance is over time, um, but obviously it gets out of balance because of these things, right? These huge, mm, uh, unprecedented, um, you know, issues that come up for re- li- literally for anyone, this would destroy them a lot of times. So let's talk about this in the moment. Um, and then let's compare that to now. You talked about, hey, you started drinking, you went from five days a week to seven days mm-hmm. a week. Mm-hmm. That's how you were coping with the stress with, mm-hmm. you know, the, the imbalance here. So let's actually, I kind of want to focus on what you're doing now. What are you doing now to have a better balance and deal with the stresses and deal with, with uh, life? Well, I'll tell you how, what I'm doing now uh, on a quick story. Um, it, back in Chris of Christmas of last year. So my wife died in June of 20 of 01. So that following Christmas, my mom just died in November. So, and I put my cat down to 16 years the day before my mom died. So <laughs> I had a tremendous amount of grief thrown at me since June of 21 to not even count my son's death. And so Christmas came along. And so I was going through a bunch, uh, it was a Friday and my sons were out and um, I was going through one box that I found. And on the top of the box, um, there was a, uh, there was a letter on top of the box and uh, dear mom and dad, I feel this letter is long overdue and I owe it to you guys to let you know just how I feel. That letter was written when my son was in prison. And that's about how far I made it. And I'd never seen the letter before. And to this moment, I've never read any further than I've just gone. It's four pages. I don't want to read the letter because it's, it's a conversation I can have with my son someday. If I read the letter, I just feel like I, I always can look forward to reading this letter. So I can't, I can't finish the letter. And that, that's as far as I've ever gotten with it. And it sits behind my desk and it's four pages long. And I went from, this was just last Christmas. I went from Mr. Undeterred to, you know, a, a 10 down to about a seven in like 10 seconds. And then I went to the next box and it was my wife and it was our trips to Europe and it was the wedding pictures. And, and I went so fast 
that I knew it took me seven seconds to get to my safe. And that's the first time I've considered suicide on this whole journey. And this was less than a year ago. So I'm telling you, I'm telling your people, your watchers, your followers, your listeners, I don't care who you think you are. I don't care how strong you think you are. If Mr. Living Undeterred can consider that as an option less than a year ago, anyone can. And so there's a delicate dance between, between being an advocate and ending up doing something I would certainly, certainly regret if, if that happened. So let me pivot to it for a second. So I turned off my phone, turned off my computer that Friday. I didn't, I didn't answer it for two full days. I don't remember what I did. I didn't drink. I don't do drugs. I just sat in my bed and probably watched Netflix and cried all, all for two days. And finally, my business partner's wife came over on Sunday, knocked on the door and, and they literally broke in and um, they came out and they talked and they listened and, um, and uh, it was the lowest place I've probably ever been in my life, even, even, even lower than the day that my wife and my son died. And so what I did, Travis, is like the next couple of days, I had to really think, okay, how did I get myself? What, what happened? What, what, what set me off? And it wasn't so much what set me off. It was my overconfidence in my preparation. So I had skipped my meditation and I'm getting to my point here. I skipped my meditation. I skipped my working out. I was eating pizza and I had thought I've whipped my therapy. I thought I was over grief. I was doing podcasts and books and I was just, you know, I, I already had the RV bought. I had my tour all planned. You know, I mean, I was, I was bulletproof, man. And I let my guard down. And so what I realized, it wasn't the contents of the box or the boxes. It was the contents of this box that got me in trouble. That letter, this letter has no emotion to it. I put the emotion into it. So by reframing an old stoic philosophy, by looking at this from a different lens, I was able to simply understand that I got myself in this position because I took shortcuts. So that's, that's one of my stories now when I talk to people is if this guy and I'm, I'm not anything special. Don't, I'm not saying this guy, like I'm some rock star. I, I, th I do think I figured out a lot of ways that have helped me, but if I could let my guard down that quickly in literally minutes after being such a mental health staple and advocate and surround myself around super strong people, then anybody can do that. And so I need to keep building up this bulletproof barrier around me. So I added 10 minutes to my meditation. I do 20 minutes now. I run an hour and 15 minutes every day on my elliptical or I will die. That's my mindset. And so if it's Sunday and I'm flying in 10 o'clock at night, I come down running my elliptical um, because I'm terrified right now of ever having those thoughts again. And I know exactly why I had them. I took shortcuts. So more of my story is you think you're asking me about my coping mechanisms. I meditate. I'm, I'm vegan light most of the week. Um, I lost 40 pounds after I quit drinking and changed my diet. Uh, I'm 56. I, I, I read pot. I read things. I listen to podcasts. Um, I haven't watched TV in years. Uh, I, don't, I have no idea about, I don't follow politics. I don't follow the stock market anymore. I don't follow anything like that. Um, everything I do is, is uh, holistic. It's deep inner, inner uh, awareness of, of thoughts, um, challenging myself. I don't like echo chambers. So I constantly read books and watch podcasts on things that I don't agree with. Um, not to get mad, but to learn, you know, that perspective that I'm always in learning mode. Those are things I do, Travis. And, Love it. you know, I'm just terrified that, that I could go back to that day. And so I'm, I'm hypersensitive that I, I need to just, I don't know, it's almost an addiction in itself. I'm like addicted to not ever going back to that day where I almost took my life, you know, and then two days ago on Seth's death date anniversary, I got close again. Mm -hmm. It was two days ago. Uh, I had some really dark, I shut my phone off for 24 hours. I do that when I make it in that zone where I feel like I, I, I'm alone, but if you called me, Travis, I wouldn't answer the phone. And I don't know what to call that. I don't want to put a label on it because I think our society does a crappy job on putting labels on people, telling kids that attention deficits, a disorder, um, take a pill, or you're going to eat your friends at midnight. You know, this, this dialogue, we have to change. We have to stop telling kids that these things are disorders. What they are is it makes you human. We all have attention deficit. Some of us are zero on the spectrum. Some of us are 10. Right. Um, and we don't do that. And uh, no. that's, that's another initiative that I'm on is really trying to get us to stop using these words that we use to label people because we all have depression. Some of us, it's a zero. Some of us, it's a 10. You know, um, it just 
again, if what we were doing was working, I wouldn't be doing any of this. I'd be selling cars probably. So we need to be doing something with changing the narrative. We need to be looking at this from a different lens. And so one of my projects is a new company that we're going to be announcing here shortly that I'm really, really excited about that I think is really going to crush the numbers when it comes to adolescent mental health. I love that you're taking this action and you're moving forward. And, you know, something that you mentioned big time here is your physical, spiritual, uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. That's really where I find most, this is the crossover that I find so many business owners struggle with this when they're out of balance. Mm -hmm. And this is the indicator. I know they're out of balance because their health isn't great and their stress levels are high. Um, they're not connected with deity. Like as you're talking about, you know, you're changing your mindset spiritually. Meditation is a great form to do that. Mm -hmm. Pondering all of those things are, are really have been found not only scientifically, but obviously, obviously individually, mm -hmm. so many people have find, have found that as a great way to reset and connect spiritually. Can, um, can I jump on that a second? Yeah, yeah please do. Please do. I, I just, I need to cover this point because I think this will help. And it, it echoes exactly what you're talking about is, it, and maybe you can do this yourself, but I thought to myself, Travis, if I could be king for a day and I could design a perfect human for mental health, okay, what would the four quadrants be? And one you've talked about, and Stephen Gwinnip is huge on this. She's been on your show and I love her to death, is the physical. Your physical, you know, you look in the mirror and you, you don't have a hundred pounds of overweight or, or you're, you're not going to be on the road to high cholesterol and diabetes and all that. So, you know, your physical, okay? That's very important. Second is financial. And again, if you look in the mirror and you're all buff and you're good looking and you are Catholic and you believe in God, but you can't make your mortgage payment, that, that's going to cause a lot of angst in your life. So I call it the mental whole whack-a-mole. The mental health whack-a-mole dilemma is we just go after one thing and then we neglect the other things and we end up not as a whole person being in a good, good place. So we have physical and we have financial. The third is spiritual. Now, when I say spiritual, I have to be very careful with this. I'm agnostic. So for me, spirituality is inner, not upper. So, um, and, and that drives me, it, 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 it's keep, it keeps me to um, really be grateful for creating heaven on earth as opposed to waiting to go to heaven. I don't have time to wait. So I'm making heaven on earth today. And so that's my mindset. Whether I'm right or wrong doesn't really matter to me. The fact is, I think you can be a good human despite what you believe. Your behaviors are more important than your belief. Um, and so spirituality could be Buddhist, it could be Muslim, it could be Catholic, Christian, atheist, whatever. Whatever, whatever your spirituality is, I, I'm, I love the earth, I love the universe. That's my spirituality. And so the third, fourth one I was really thinking about is, is what's, what am I missing? What am I missing? And on the tour, I think in Salt Lake City, one night at a KOA, it hit me. It's existentialism. It's meaning and purpose. That's the glue to everything. So you could be a strong believer in, in, in God. You could be look great in the mirror and you could be rich. But if you don't have meaning and purpose, you're going to be lacking something. And how many people late in their life have a midlife crisis and it's not to do with looks and money and all that. It's because they haven't really found anything that they truly are altruistic about, yeah. you know? Yep, and so that, that, those are the four quadrants to me. I like it. Yeah. And so if, if you could, if you could be really good at each one, each one of those four and spend five minutes a day on each one of those four quadrants, how would your mental health improve? I don't know. Well, that's what we're going to find out. And that's one of the missions that we're on with the living on the third project and our, my, my startup company is to try to try to look at this from a planning perspective, nice. like the financial planning industry did 30 years ago. Uh, we don't have anything like mental health planning. We have whack-a-mole. We give you a pill for a diagnosis. We get you in great shape, but you can't make your mortgage payment. Or if you're rich, you're 200 pounds overweight. We just don't really have a system in place where we have a planning service. And so the thing we're trying to develop and we're there, we're going to be announcing shortly, is what we think is the nation's first mental health planning service that's interactive, that's run by adolescents. Fo we're focusing on adolescents to start with. Yeah. I love the holistic approach. And you're absolutely right. There is psychologists, there's therapists, there's social workers, mm -hmm. there are, you know, PsyDs, there are um, psychiatrists, psychologists, there's all these different yep. specifics. Like we haven't got into the 
hundreds of diagnoses in the DSM-5. Like I, right. I used to teach psych at, uh, at a university at UVU, and I found that just understanding the terms, like most people, we don't, you need a master's degree. Just it's a word, it's a word salad. A friend of it mine exactly called it a right. word salad. It is so <laughs> difficult, uh, 100%. Let's, let's uh, come back with me to the, um, the industry for a second. Mm-hmm. You know, in the industry, I, I, I'm talking about the financial industry. Yeah. If, you, if you're anywhere in this industry and you're a business owner, you're dealing with stuff. You're dealing right. with stress. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, as we talked about sympathy and empathy, you don't have to have the exact same situation as me or even as mm-hmm. Jeff or anyone else, but knowing that we're all dealing with these cracks, we're dealing with this stuff. Um, what would you say is one of the biggest issues that financial advisors, CPAs, estate planners, anyone in the financial industry are dealing with that comes, you know, straight up uh, against what we've been talking about, which is balance. Like what, mm-hmm. what do you think they struggle with when it comes to, to balance? Poor, poor delegation. I think for me, what really helped me even do what I do today is the fact that I trust people well enough to make mistakes that I empower them in positions that if they aren't making mistakes, they're not learning. So when I used to be a practicing OSJ, or I technically still am, but I have a delegate that does a good job. I used to talk about the knowledge, desire, and time dilemma with delegation. You know, if you if you lack the knowledge, desire, and time in an area, then find somebody, pay somebody to do that for you. So for example, if you if you uh, let's say mowing your yard, uh, you have the knowledge to mow your yard. Um, you have the desire to mow your yard because you don't you like the outdoors, but you just don't have the time. Well, you're paying somebody then for the time. And so for me, when it came to delegating, I would say, okay, I'm going to do a radio show. Uh, I want to be on the radio, but I don't want to do anything to do with editing. I don't want to record it. I don't want to do an outline. I don't want to distribute it. So I just paid people to do all that. So I could just literally show up, do my show and go home. And I think delegating was something that I, I learned from uh, good to great and James Collins great book about, you know, instead of finding a job saying we got to hire an HR person and we got to hire a, a, you know, whatever you want to hire to, to fill that position, find great people and just make jobs up for them. I thought that was just, for me, that was mind blowing. And I, I read his book, I want to spend 15 years ago, maybe. And it really changed my mindset on finding advocates in my, in my space that I can work with. So when I, um, our new employee, we just hired for my non, for my for-profit, my startup company. Um, I didn't look at the resume real long. Uh, I, I talked to her um, and felt comfortable and kind of went with that, that feeling. But um, I don't know. I just, I just think there's something about delegation that as business owners, that they're trying to do it all themselves. No one can do it as good as you. Um, the buck stops with me mindset. It's like, you need to give your team the autonomy Um you know, they, they still have, you know, limits, but that they're, they're okay to make mistakes, you know, and you can't be a boss and be walking down the hallway and yelling at people all the time that that mindset doesn't work. And I don't know many businesses that have been built up on that structure, you know, I think delegating is the key to me. I think I really think that would give a lot of business owners more freedom to really decide what their, their, you know, meaning and purpose is and, and their spiritual life and those type of things, their health, all that can come into play if you got someone else doing the other parts of your quote job, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. The D word comes up on every podcast. Uh, <laughs> it should. It, 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 just, should. It, it always does. And everybody has a different uh, design uh, analogy and practice. I like that you you're talking about, you know, kind of like if you don't have the knowledge, desire or time, right? Well, I love that. There's, there's a three prong for just about everything. That yep. three prong is very practical. You can take that away. And I love Jim Collins stuff. I just re-listened to his book, Good to Great, um, a little while ago. And honestly, he his book, after years and years of being a bestseller, still a bestseller. Oh, yeah. But his book was one that I was able to get in front of on the book uh, that we just you know released a couple of years ago, Achieving Balance. And you know, here's a guy who's been writing stuff like this literally for years. Mm-hmm. All of his books are bestsellers. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what an honor that was to be close to him for a day. <laughs> and and uh, his stuff is really impactful in what you were talking about because it's not just getting 
the right people on the bus, but it's finding the right jobs for them on the bus, the right seats on the bus, right? Yeah, um, you know, or creating a job for them, like as you were mentioning, and and that's huge. I, I love this because as soon as this podcast is done, it goes to my podcast editing team. They edit it, they publish it, they put it on the platforms, right? They put it on my social media. Yep. And I have an assistant when all that's done, she sends it out to my, you know, my newsletter and say, Hey guys, here it is. Right. I, 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 this is it. This is the last thing that I do. Um, with I know. And, and when I first tried to get on your podcast, I, I spoke with one of your people that kind of vetted me and interviewed me and screened me. So yeah, I mean, I will validate that certainly. Yeah, and right. it allows you to be in your zone. Exactly. And, and that's what you're good at. That's what you like to do. And maybe you could be good at editing, but right now you'd rather move on to the next podcast after this and and do your prep and all that. And that's, I think that's exactly right, Travis. I think delegating is an art and it's something that's a lost art these days. And Jeff, I know you've got a lot going on and I know we need to end for today and I appreciate your time. If advisors, business owners in this space or beyond parents, they want to get in touch with you, follow what you're doing. Um, watch the tour again next summer as you make your way around. What, what's the best way to get in touch with you, man? Well, I'm all, I'm all over social media, as are you. Uh, LinkedIn has probably um, been the one I've, I gravitate to the most. I'm on Facebook as well under Living Undeterred and Jeff Johnston, um, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. But people can email me. It's jeff at livingundeterred.org. Um, I do respond to personal messages. As you can imagine, I get I get probably five a day of people wanting to see if I can help them through something. And I keep reminding them I'm not a clinician. I'm just a dad from Iowa, but somehow I think the platform I have, people think I'm an, an expert or a doctor in these areas, but I think I have a lived experience that maybe is more than a designation or a degree sometimes. <laughs> um, but I lean into the opportunity and it's an honor to be on your show. And I, I hope that somebody listening to this, whatever they're going through, um, they can tell themselves that, you know, pain is unavoidable, but suffering is a choice. And so I can't reduce the pain of bearing a wife and a child, but I certainly can mitigate the suffering, the time and the length and the intensity that I suffer. That is my choice. And um, I choose not to suffer very long. <laughs> I do suffer, but not very long. I appreciate this. Your story your authenticity, your willingness to share. And, you know, I found for me after coming back, bearing my father, that just talking it through, mm -hmm. not only, uh, you know, we can talk grief and that's not really the focus of today, but it's obviously coming up a lot. Right. Um, but I, I found that that really enabled me to do realize this actually happened. This is real. This isn't my made up craziness. that's going on right. in my mind. And then it allowed me to um, really connect with others and to be empathetic uh, with other situations. So, man, my hat's off to you. What you're doing is phenomenal. Please connect with Jeff, follow his story, and see where he's going with what he's trying to do for the mental health uh, arena and, and making lives better for adolescents and families. So thank you for being on the show, Jeff. Thank you very much and good luck with uh, what you're doing and uh, keep living undeterred, my friend. Thank you. You guys have loved this. Like, share, connect with Jeff, leave us comments, tell us how we're doing on this. This is really for you. This is our give back to the industry and beyond to help advisors, business owners to live a better balanced life. So for the both of us, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, audience. And remember, live life on purpose. 